Cairo, Seattle. It's time to get schooled with the professor, John Clayton. Welcome to School with the Professor. Joining us now from the NFL Network is Brian Billick. And, of course, uh, Brian, the great part is, you know, you start the season, and it's great talking to you because, I mean, there's so many trends and things I'm trying to get into. And I guess the first thing to get started is your, your thoughts on what it's like right now to build an offensive line. Because I think we've noticed it, particularly in the last couple of years, certainly noticed it in the first week of the season. There's a lot of bad offensive lines in this league, and it's been, it seems to get harder and harder to rebuild them. You're right. And and think about it. Just one, just the sheer numbers. And then you're not talking about just the starting five. You've got to have that fifth man to either be your swing guard slash center. You've got to have a swing tackle. And you've got to have depth in your offensive line as well. And the, the, the teams that are really good, you see like the Dallas Cowboys uh, and the Pittsburgh Steelers, they've put assets there. They've made, made that a priority by way of draft choices. So, to try to piece a line together, um, it, it can be very, very difficult. I did the uh, Baltimore Ravens preseason games, and they did not have their starting offensive line that showed up against Cincinnati. They did not take one snap the entire preseason. You know, it's it's one of those things where you just hope that it can come together and be functional. Yeah, and but the one thing is just seeming. It, it seems like it's not just like a, a watering down effect. It's like okay, you have maybe a half dozen really good offensive lines, and there's a drop off where almost everybody else is in the same state where they don't have a good offensive line. Yeah, and and it, it typically it's because too um, the value that you place on it. For instance, the guard position, which is not one that a lot of people put a lot of value in, in terms of when I say value, I mean a first round draft choice, something of that nature. But the center guard, the interior of the offensive line, obviously there's focus on the tackles, but it's the interior of the offensive line anymore. That's kind of the vogue thing to get pass rush up the middle uh, and to have that competent center that can make all the line calls, to have a, two good guards, to have the athleticism to get up to the set level. Yeah, it's and, and we're also talking about a time where in college football, the things they're doing in college football offensive linemen – don't really resemble what they're going to do in the pro game. So there's a learning curve as well. How many good offensive lines do you think there are in this league? Oh, boy. You know, that that's a tough one to quantify. If, if, if you're talking about top flight, you know, top of the heap, put assets in it like the Dallas Cowboy, there's probably only four or five that you could really look at and say, okay, this team has really put – you know, the, the, the time in, and when I mean time, I mean time and resources of putting an offensive line together. You know, in terms of some of the other solid, okay clubs, you know, maybe 10 deep. After that, you know, it's kind of like quarterback play. You know, once you get into the second half of the league, it doesn't take much to pick that apart. Now, of course, Seattle had nothing but problems with the offensive line in the first game against the Green Bay Packers. And I know from being on the sidelines, the Green Bay Packers had problems on their offensive line, a line that used to be very, very good. What kind of overview for a team like Seattle that's really for about three, four years have been trying to fix up the offensive line, and here they are one week into the season, and they don't know if it's fixed or not? Yeah, that and and they went into last, you know, we knew that was a problem last year in terms of the inability to run the ball, notwithstanding the loss of Marshawn Lynch, the fact that that uh, Russell Wilson's going to have to probably be a 500 plus throw guys that changes the dynamic when they were running up and down through the league, leading the league in rushing, and Russell Wilson was a 430, 440 throw type guy. Now it puts a higher premium on it. Um, it's interesting. They kind of felt they could stay put. They've got a lot of faith in Tom Cable and thought, you know what, we'll coach these guys up and, and we'll be okay. And, and obviously there's a little bit more to that because that group did struggle, obviously, against Green Bay. It's always hard in the first game to say, are we saying more about the Green Bay defense or are we saying less about the Seattle offensive line? So it's kind of, you know, which is it? Uh, in this instance, I think that offensive line still has some real issues. Yeah, no question. And uh, how much can that hold back a team? I think clearly it prevented Seattle last year from probably you know getting to the Super Bowl. Although you know they a couple breaks here and there, they might have been able to make it. But you know it cost uh, the first half of the season when Russell Wilson had two injuries. It certainly cost them about a hundred carries because they missed about a hundred carries. They like to run it five hundred times. They ran it four hundred three. But uh, how how much can that set you back? Well, when you're when you're whole philosophy is wrapped around as it is with Pete Carroll play great defense run the ball uh, and they're certainly going to play great defense but 
their ability to run the ball from when they were, you know, at their at their height. Obviously, with Rawls and Lacey and Procise, you know, these are, it's going to be running back by committee per se. I don't think there's that dominant physical presence in any of those that you had Marshawn Lynch. We've already talked about the offensive line, uh, and so that puts more pressure on Russell Wilson to make those plays down the field. Pete, Pete Carroll would love to be a 500 carry. 400 throw team, and there's not a lot out there. I mean, to be balanced in the NFL today is not 50-50. If you're 60% pass, 40% run, you're balanced in today's NFL because typically, typically it's going to be 70% pass, 30% run. They don't want to be there, but but that's where they're at with a receiving core that is, I won't, you know, I, it, it's an okay receiving core. I, I wouldn't call it in the top half of the league in terms of the receiving core. So when you look at the attended pieces to an offensive line that seems to struggle a little bit, Russell Wilson's got, you know, he's got some issues around him that uh, that make it tough. Yeah. Did you get a chance to look back at any film of the uh, Seahawk game against Green Bay to kind of get some evaluations? I did. I did. And, and you know, again, anytime you look and you're just talking about one game, and yeah. I, I always go back, I've got all the film available to me as I prepare for my uh, show playbook that we do every Wednesday on the NFL Network at 6 p.m., uh, and I've got the Sabre mechanism here where I can go back and look through every film, and that's exactly what I do. And when you look at it, again, going into Green Bay and losing to Green Bay, there's no shame in that now. Green Bay is pretty right. good. That first half, boy, you talk about a defensive slugfest. But Aaron Rodgers and what they were able to do in the second half, um, and I do think Green Bay is a better defense. Let's remember how beat up they were the second half of last season. So I, I don't think we should – I think this may have been more about a very good Green Bay team who's tough to beat at home and Aaron Rodgers. I thought Martellus Bennett was the best free agency pickup of all of last season because now when you opposite of him, if you want to go in one of those three-by-one sets that's so popular in the league right now, and you're going to have Jordy Nelson, who led the league in touchdown receptions last year, um, Devontae Freeman. Uh, uh, Devontae Adams, excuse me, who was second in the league in touchdown receptions. You throw in a, a healthy, looks very fresh Randall Cobb, a Ty Montgomery who's now really gotten into the groove of his role. And opposite that, oh, by the way, we've now got uh, Martellus Bennett, and you saw that in the second half of the game where all of a sudden some key downs, Martellus Bennett got the ball because you had to account for that three-receiver side. I think this was maybe more about Green Bay uh, and how good they may be than the questions on Seattle. By the way, these are the gems that you're going to be able to hear every Wednesday on the NFL Network on NFL Playbook. That's 3 p.m. Pacific time, and uh, Brian does such a great job of breaking it down. In fact, I was on the sidelines, and I was doing the Packers sidelines, and what uh, what I was amazed at, because really, Mike McCarthy was out there. I mean, he didn't use as many uh, trip formations, three receiver sets. In fact, there was probably about maybe, oh, I'd say 30, 35% of the time, they're either in two tight end, a couple times three tight end, and then two back sets, and so they they really kind of I mean, part of that I think is goes to the offensive line. You know, Brian Balaga didn't play the game, and so they had a first time uh, right tackle start. And there's no experience on the backups right now uh, for the line, so he looked protective, but in many ways it was effective. Yeah, and Mike McCarthy for a while now, much like in New Orleans with Sean Payton, has talked about we need to be more balanced. We need to be able to run the ball. We really don't want as brilliant as Aaron Rodgers is. We don't want to throw the ball 600 plus times. We want to be able to close out a game. We want to have a certain amount of physicality. So that means you're going to have more of the two tight end, include the running back. You know, they took this Jamal Williams out of BYU in the fourth round. Uh, I think he adds a physical dimension for them that they want to be able to have. To they want to what they what we saw against Seattle, I think, is more of what they would like to be as opposed to the pure three wides throw it 600 times. Mm-hmm. No question. Uh, on the other side, uh, Seattle's defense looks really good, particularly with the addition of Sheldon Richardson and adding a few young, uh, a few uh, veteran pass rushers to kind of give them a little bit more depth on the defense. Yeah, I mean that's that's hardly fair to add a player like the caliber of Sheldon Richardson into that that front seven of Seattle. And I noticed they were doing a lot more of what we used to call solid fronts which means you basically bring the ends and the tackles down. You put Sheldon Richardson uh, maybe over the nose and then bring guys and, and cover up the center and the guards. Now that creates a lot, and then you can pepper those linebackers. That's going to create a lot of one-on-one matchups on the interior of an offensive line that are going to give people some problems. And, of course, the back end, uh, that, that was impressive, what the back end in Seattle. Uh, although I must say, you know, the Legion of Boom, they're as good as advertised. 
Uh, watching the game last night against Minnesota, I think that secondary in Minnesota is right there step for step in terms of the most physical secondaries in the league. Okay, and again, you know Mike Zimmer. I mean, uh, he loves to have his guys just be aggressive. I mean, they're you know they're great covering and they're angular and usually, but boy, he loves to make them tackle and tackle hard. Yeah, they're gonna they're you know the the, the rep on corners, you know, obviously is is to use a Deion Sanders phrase, they're not paid to make tackles. Uh, but in Mike Zimmer's defense, yeah, you are, and and you got to be physical in Seattle's defense as well. So it, it just lends itself to that an entire defense being physical when your back end is as physical as they are in Seattle and in Minnesota. As a coach in the league, and particularly as looking at the way you do things now, how long does it take now to just uh, get settled in on your offense? Because, you know, uh, there's a big difference from maybe 10 years ago. Number one, I mean, you don't have the extra practice time. You don't have the extra hitting. I mean, there's so little a coach can do to get things ready. So, I don't know, it, did it used to be three weeks, or now is it four weeks or five weeks to really settle in to what you're going to be offensively? Well, I think we saw this first week with just a couple exceptions. Typically, the defense is usually a little ahead of the offense because of the timing. You know, you see a lot of big plays because, you know, you make a mistake on offense and you punt. You make a mistake on defense and strike up the band and kick an extra point. Uh, and so we saw a lot of big plays. We saw that in the Kansas City New, uh, New England game, a couple broken coverages that led to big, big plays. Uh, a couple of big plays last night with New Orleans and, 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 and the Saints, obviously. And then obviously what you see uh, typically with Aaron Rodgers and his ability to make big plays down the field when you, when you break a coverage or you jump offside, something of that nature. Uh, so offenses typically, it takes a couple weeks, uh, probably not as long as you think, uh, that to, for things to come together. Of course, injuries are going to be a factor as well in terms of getting into that groove. You look at a team like the Baltimore Ravens, now to lose Danny Woodhead all of a sudden with what they were going to do with him. Now you have to adjust. So, yeah, notwithstanding injury, there's a couple of weeks where you got to kind of settle into exactly who and what you're going to be. Yeah, I don't want to try to tip off your playbook for Wednesday at 3 p.m. on the NFL Network, uh, but I do want to try to see if you can unravel a couple mysteries for me. The New York Giants offense. A year ago, Jerry Reese does a great job, spends $200 million in unrestricted free agent contracts to get the defense fixed, and they shave 10 points a game off. And then here's offensive play caller Ben McAdoo is the head coach. They were averaging 26 points a game in 2005. They dropped down below 20, and they looked even worse on uh, in the opener against Dallas. What has happened to the Giants offense? Well, I, and I th- it's, you can go back to the time when Tom Coughlin was there. I remember visiting with Tom Coughlin when I was doing a game, and his biggest concern was he felt like they had evolved. They'd not been very physical in the offensive line, that they lacked what you know uh, uh, Chuck Noll used to call that six-inch punch. Uh, and, of course, back then New York was all about being a physical running game uh, to then augment an Eli Manning. And, and the same thing. I mean, they've put some draft choices in that offensive line. You're talking about two first rounders, two second rounders, and they're just not, they just don't seem to have that same physicality uh, that they've had in the past. So I think it does begin with the offensive line. And the running backs are, are again, they're not, they, they don't have the big physical punishing running backs. Uh, so they're not able to establish that. And it all then drops down into Eli Manning, who, as we know, can get hot and can be as good as anybody, can get on a stretch, though, too. Where, where there are turnovers and, of course, to go into the game without uh, an OBJ uh, and to not have that physical running game, all of a sudden now that offense can look pretty pedestrian. Yeah. I mean, do you think it can be fixed? I mean, I, I look at the talent there when uh, Odell Beckham Jr. comes back that uh, they might have the most talented three receivers set in, in football with Brandon Marshall added to the mix. But, uh, you know, so far it's you know, the slow start. Beckham not there for a couple weeks probably with a high ankle sprain. Uh, I mean, can they get that fixed? Well, uh, it's hard, particularly this, you know, you're, you're already into it and your offensive line is what it is and your running game is obviously the three wide receivers, if healthy, will make a difference because that will loosen the box, so to speak, that allow you to run the ball more. But I'll, again, I'll keep coming back to the, to the pitch count at the quarterback. But if Eli Manning is a 600 plus throw guy this year, I don't think that bodes well for New York. Um, I, I think obviously as good as they're playing defense, they're going to need more in the running game. Uh, they're going to play in a physical division. In that regard, um, 
the, the and, I, and I don't mean that Eli Manning's not playing well and that he can't, he's not capable of producing at 600 yards. I'm not saying that. I'm just saying that that, that formula for them, I'm not sure they're good enough as a team to be a team that is going to throw the ball almost exclusively. On the flip side, how good is Dallas, particularly now knowing that Ezekiel Elliott's going to be there indefinitely because of at least the overturn or the restraining order on the, on the suspension? Well, yeah, I mean, the fact that, that offensively, again, we talk, you talk about offensive line and, and maybe the best offensive line in football and a running back that is so physical. That's the thing with Ezekiel Elliott. He's, he's always gets you positive yards. And Dak Prescott, I think you're also seeing, is continuing to grow to be able to take advantage. When you want to build that box, his ability to get the ball down the field to Des Bryant, Terrence Williams, Cole Beasley with that spectacular one-handed catch that he made, and, of course, Jason Witten, um, I think you're going to see an increased ability for them to do damage down the field as you have to bring that extra guy in the box to stop the run uh, and account for Ezekiel Elliott and that offensive line. And then the defense, you know, last year uh, they did just such a great job with the talent level they had. They're a little bit better on defense. They're not a top half of the league defense necessarily, but they're right around that. They're better, and, and uh, Rod Marinelli does such a great job with them. Uh, they're not going to tend to get beat deep. Uh, so they're, you know, they have a good formula for them. They're going to pound away at you, make some big plays, get a bit of a lead, and that defense continues to get better. So yeah, they're as advertised, and a lot of people's picked to, to be the best team in the NFC. We'll see if that's the case, but they're certainly in the conversation. Speaking of big backs, I mean, any impressions of what you've seen either in the preseason or the first game from Eddie Lacy? Uh, you know what? Uh, pared down a little bit. I don't think he's going to be the dominant physical presence that they're used to. With Marshawn Lynch, um, I think he can give them a good physical presence in Seattle. Um, but again, it comes back, you've got to have that offensive line as well. So, yeah, he's going to, I think he could have a good season. I don't think he's going to be a 300 plus carry dominant physical back uh, that you saw. You know, and, there's, and, and in fairness, there's not a lot of guys that are that. I mean, Zeke Liella was the only guy that threw, uh, carried the ball for 300 plus times last year. Carson Palmer, who you've gone against so many times through the years, got off to a slow start. Uh, then they find out that David Johnson is going to miss probably half the season with a wrist injury. Uh, thoughts on the Arizona offense? That's a concern. You know, uh, and Carson Palmer's been a great quarterback. I don't know where he is in terms of his progression. We keep talking about guys like him and Tom Brady and how long they can go. I'm, I'm concerned because when it happens, when a quarterback hits that point, you know, I mean, the fall off is precipitous. And I don't know if Carson Palmer is there or not, uh, but it's got to be a concern. And to lose David Johnson and that flexibility that he gave them, their defense is, is obviously going to continue to be fairly solid. But offensively, that's got to be a concern. I'm, 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 I'm not sure where Arizona is going to be right now uh, going forward, whether you know people really thought they could bounce back and be that team that they were two years ago. I'm not so sure they're not going to look more like what they were last year. No question. And uh, what what a baffling start for Cincinnati. Playing Baltimore, getting just shut out, and Andy Dalton having a bad start. I know Baltimore's defense looks like it's going to be sensational, but uh, how much did that surprise you, the way that game went? Because those games, have been, man, I probably covered more than anybody else, are usually very close. Yes, uh, Baltimore struggled in Seattle, uh, Cincinnati the last few years. So to go in, I, I always put a great deal of value winning on the road. So I think that was a substantial win. I did the Ravens preseasons games. You're right. That defense is absolutely for real. That front seven, uh, they're as good and as deep in the secondary as they've been for a while. The question was offensively about offensive lines. That offensive line did not play a single snap together in its entirety um, in the entire preseason. So they were really betting on the come. Uh, I think it's a better offensive line than people give it credit for, but it's got to stay healthy. And they've kind of you know settled in when they've got – Stanley on the left tackle, Hurst, who has played tackle on right side, left side. He's in at guard. Jensen solidified at center. Marshall Yonda is a perennial pro bowler at guard. And Austin Howard is a big physical presence. He seems to hold up. To lose Danny Woodhead, that, that would be tough because they were really counting on him to be kind of the extended running game out of the backfield. They've got three potentially big play receivers with Perriman and Wallace going deep, and then Jeremy Macklin will take up the intermediate uh, receptions that a Dennis Pitta had at the tight end position last year. So they potentially could be solid on offense to go with really a spectacular defense. Uh, what was it, five turnovers that they generated against Cincinnati? going to be tough to beat anybody 
uh, if you turn the ball over five times. Cincinnati just didn't seem to have anything they could hang their hat on. Uh, and you talk about a must game all but in week two, this Thursday night with Houston and Cincinnati coming off the losses they have. This going, somebody's going to be in really bad shape after Thursday night. Yes, that Houston uh, Bengal game is going to be at 525 uh, Pacific time on the NFL Network. And then finally, I don't want to just I – mean, who are the best defenses in the league right now? Well, you got to, you know, you, you got to begin obviously uh, with with I think Seattle obviously and Minnesota obviously have the pedigrees, and you know they're going to be really really good. I think Pittsburgh is going to be very good defensively. The second half of the season, they were outstanding last year, and they pick up a Joe Hayden. You've already talked about Baltimore. That that group is very very much for real. So, you know, Denver looks to be, even though there were concerns what happens with the changeover and Wade Phillips not there, they look to be as solid as usual, as is Kansas City. They've got the personnel, particularly with the rush up front. So, yeah, there are a lot of good defenses out there. Uh, New York's, we've already talked about, is going to be excellent as well. I think Green Bay is going to be substantially better uh, than they were last year. So there's a lot of good defenses out there. Hey, Brian, it's always great to catch up with you. And don't forget the, the NFL Playbook at 3 p.m. Pacific. That's on every Wednesday on the NFL Network. Brian, hope to be seeing you soon. All right, John. And that does it for this week's podcast. In between episodes, you can follow me on Twitter at Clayton ESPN. If you enjoy these weekly one-on-one conversations, consider leaving a review on iTunes or wherever you're listening to the show. Thanks for listening. See you next time on Schooled with the Professor.